Well, I hope you folks are as excited about being here this morning as I am to teach this, this class. I've been looking forward to, uh, to it for a long time, and I trust that God is going to bless the effort and, and his word as we study this. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you and we are thankful that your word is uh, given to us so that we can learn it. And you give us uh, sound doctrine in your word. And you do that, Father, so we could uh, follow you and do what you want us to do. We pray that this subject that we studied uh, beginning today and, uh, and, and carry on for a few weeks, we pray, Father, that this will uh, uh, op open our minds to what you have to say on this subject. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For the first 12 years after I graduated high school, I did construction work. This was followed by four years of Bible college, and I went to seminary four years after that. But one of the things I learned about doing construction work was the importance of laying a foundation uh, to any structure that, that, that you're building. I think Jesus states this as a spiritual principle in reference to his teaching because he says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rains fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and it was, a, a, it was great with its fall. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying, but my words are not equal to, to, to the words of Jesus. Uh, that is, except when I quote Jesus or use passage of scripture. But what I am saying today is that I would like to use this lesson to build a solid foundation for us to go on in our study on this subject. In other words, instead of just jumping right in to teach this doctrine, I would like to just lay the foundation for us to build on in the weeks to come. As you know, it has been advertised that uh, the uh, topic of this study is the security of the believer. First of all, I want to start off with a definition. What does it mean, the security of the believer? It means that once a person is saved, that means he receives eternal life from God, that he can never lose his salvation, or he can never lose his eternal life. Now, why is this study important? I want to give you three reasons why this study is important. First of all, it is one of the important um, doctrines of this church. Mandeville Bible Church has 17 points of doctrine in its doctrinal statement. Point 13 says, and I quote, we believe that all believers are kept secure forever in that they cannot lose their salvation. And then following the statement, uh, the doctrinal statement gives uh, four scripture passages to, to show where this is so. The second reason why this doctrine is important is that an understanding of this doctrine will give believers and I use the term believers as those people who have already placed their faith in Christ for their eternal life, uh, an understanding of this doctrine will give believers a lot of peace of mind and a lot of peace of heart because we will know that we can never lose the salvation that God has given to us. Regardless of what happens to our life, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves, uh, or the difficulties, we know that we can never lose our sal salvation. We will never miss heaven and go to hell. The third reason to study this doctrine 
is that we believe that there are some people who misunderstand Scripture. And they do believe that, that, that it is possible for a person to lose their salvation and end up in, in hell. Because we believe that this is incorrect doctrine, we feel like it is the church's responsibility to teach its members correct doctrine so that they will know what the Bible says on this subject. They will not be thrown a curve and begin to worry about something which God says won't happen. And in this case, it's, it's that we won't lose our salvation. Any questions before I, I, I move on? Everybody understands what I have said thus, thus far? Great. I want to... I want to begin this morning after clarifying that I want to continue to add to our foundation by stating a clear, concise question that will set the boundaries of our studies that a believer cannot lose his salvation. When studying any Bible study or subject, it's important to have the topic clear within our minds. We do that by asking a question that zeroes in on the precise information that we are looking for. In other words, stating the question correctly will help us to find the answers to the questions we are looking for. For instance, uh, when studying the issue of the security of the believer, the best question to ask is not, can a person fall from God's, God's grace? That's not the best question to ask. When studying the subject of security of the believer, the best question that, is, that shouldn't be asked is, can a saved person continue to live in sin after he is saved? Now, I, I'm not saying that those questions are not important. What I am saying is that those questions do not zero in on the question or the main question that we are looking for. And uh, those, are, those questions address the connecting issue to, this, to the subject of a person losing his salvation. I think that the best way to state the question is what I have written on, on the board. If a person was once saved, can he ever lose his salvation? If a person was once saved, can he ever lose his salvation? Now, why do I state the question like that? It is because when the question is stated like that, we can focus on the word saved. We can focus on the word saved if a, uh, and we can see that that is what we are looking for. A person falling from grace or a Christian falling from grace or a Christian living in sin after he is saved, those are more side issues to the, to the topic, but they don't zero in on the main issue of, of the topic. Now, in our study, we will address those side issues, but we're going to address them as side issues, not as the main issue that we are looking for. So when I ask the question, if a person was once saved, can he ever be lost? We will immediately eliminate the people who just had some religious experience, but they have never trusted in Jesus Christ to give them eternal life. We also immediately eliminate people who might have walked out an aisle in some church service, or raised their hand in some church service, or filled out a commitment card in some churches, in some service, but they never put their trust in Christ for their eternal life. We are also eliminating people who only joined the church or who only were, was baptized, but they never trusted in Christ to take them to heaven. We are also not talking about people who think that they are saved because they try to live a good moral life or they try to do some good deeds, but they never trusted in Christ for their eternal life. We are also not talking about people who just had some kind of emotional experience, 
but they never trusted in Christ to take them to heaven. We are not talking about people who have trusted in Christ, but they only trusted in Christ to heal them from some disease or to meet some financial need or to get them out of, out of some trouble, but they never trusted in Christ to take them to heaven. Now, I want to draw this distinction because most churches, maybe I can say all churches, have people in them who had one or more of these experiences, but they never placed their faith in Christ to take them to heaven. And because they have not, they may think that they are saved, but they are not. So by asking the question, if a person was once saved, can he ever be lost, we immediately are narrowing our focus to people who are really saved. And people are saved because they have trusted Christ for their eternal life. Now, when a person puts their faith in Christ for their eternal life, a lot of good things happen to him. The Holy Spirit enters that person and never leaves that person. A per uh, the Holy Spirit gives uh, 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 this person, the believer, a new spiritual nature. Uh, this person is baptized into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit gives this person spiritual gifts. Uh, he receives all of the future promises that God in Christ gave to him. And his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven. All those things happen when a person puts his trust in Christ to take him to heaven. So when we state the question like that, if a person was once saved, can he ever be lost? We are really asking, when a person who trusted in Christ for his salvation and the Holy Spirit entered that person, will the Holy Spirit ever leave that, uh, that, that person? When a person who trusted in Christ for his salvation and he received a new spiritual nature, can that person ever lose the spiritual nature that was given to him when he was saved? When a person who trusted in Christ for his salvation and he was baptized in the body of Christ, can he ever be kicked out of the body of Christ? Can he ever no longer be a part of the body of Christ? When a person who trusted in Christ for his salvation and the Holy Spirit gave him some spiritual gifts, will he ever lose those spiritual gifts? Will he ever have those spiritual gifts taken away from him? When a person who trusted in Christ for his salvation and he received all of the future promises that God, that God in Christ gave him, Will he ever lose those promises? Will God in Christ ever take them back? When a person who trusted in Christ for his salvation and his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven, will he ever have his name taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life? Or will he ever have his name erased out of the Lamb's Book of Life? I think these are legitimate questions because all of these questions state some positive things that, helps, that, that, uh, that happens to a person when he is saved. And if a person was to lose his salvation, then all those negative things would have to happen. So this study will focus on the eternal security of a person who is really saved. I hope to demonstrate that there is plenty of evidence in the Bible and from sound theology that will show that a person who is really saved cannot lose his salvation. Now at this point, I want to ask, is, is there any questions? Is there any questions or comments, things that I need to clarify before we... Is that Jesus is God. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. In other words, he was born of a virgin, he is both fully God and fully man. He is not half God and half man, but he's fully God and fully man. Why is this important to believe in, in, in the deity of Christ? Because if Jesus was not God, then an ordinary man named Jesus died on the cross 
And an ordinary man is not sinless and not qualified to die for our sin. So for a person to be saved, he's got to accept the fact that Jesus is, is God. And, and that's one, one of the points. The second point or bit of information that a person needs to know before he can be saved is that Jesus Christ died on the cross as our substitute. And while dying on the cross, God placed upon Jesus the punishment for all of the sins that we should have gotten for our sins. Why is that important? It is because we are sinners and Jesus Christ is sinless. And it is because he is sinless, he was the only one that was worthy enough to pay the penalty for our sins and satisfy God's holy demand for the punishment of sin. The third part of information a person needs to know is that Jesus Christ not only died for our sins, but he also rose from the dead, proving that God was pleased with the sacrifice he made for our sins and that he accepted the punishment that Christ <clears throat> endured for our sins. The fourth information that a person needs to know for him to be saved is that eternal life can only be obtained by placing one placing his faith or trust in the person of Jesus Christ to give him e e eternal life. Once a person has this basic knowledge, then God drops the scales from his spiritual eyes when he understands these, these truths, and he can then place his faith in Christ. Tim. And I know it's implied, but the last one is alone. 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 You're right. Faith in Christ alone. Thank you, Tim. But that leads up to a point that we're going to address. And you're right. It is faith alone in, in, in Christ. Now, my experience it shows me that before a person is saved, he is usually trusting in something that he thinks will help him get to heaven or he thinks will help him to find favor with God. It could be the good deeds that he has done, it could be his church membership, it could be his baptism, it could be the fact that he was born in a Christian home and he has Christian parents. But the Bible is clear that for a person to be saved, to have eternal life, he must make Jesus Christ the object of his faith. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said in 2 Timothy 3.15, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ. Paul was telling Timothy that, yes, you have salvation, but you have salvation because you have placed your faith, which is in Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ had to be the object of his faith. Not his good deeds, not his baptism, not his church membership. It was the person of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul responded by saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So what was Paul telling this Philippian jailer? It was that he had to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ before he could be saved. In other words, Jesus Christ had to be the object of this man's faith before this man could be, be saved. So from these verses, we see that a person is not saved just because he has faith. For a person to be saved, he must have the right object to his faith, and that has to be the person of Jesus Christ. So this brings up a good question. What is biblical faith? What is biblical faith? The word, the word, the biblical word for faith means to trust or to entrust to. Let me illustrate it like this. When you came into this room this morning, all of us, all of you took, took your seats. Um, in doing so, you were trusting in chair to who you are. Mm -hmm. That chair became the object of your faith to support your body weight. 
if you have ever taken a trip on an airplane, you were not only trusting in the airplane to hold you up, you were trusting that the pilot knew how to fly the airplane and he knew the correct way to get you to your des destination. The, air the object of your faith was both the airplane and the pilot. In the same way, God gives us eternal life when we place our faith in the person of Jesus Christ to give us eternal life. Why do we place our trust only in the person of Jesus Christ to give us eternal life? Why? It's because Christ was the only one who was qualified to die on the cross to pay for our sins. So a person gets saved by placing his faith or his trust only, as Tim said, only in the person of Jesus Christ. That is why we say for a person to be saved, he must have faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace alone. And we add that phrase, by God's grace alone, to indicate that a person cannot do any amount of good work in order to earn even part of his salvation. And I think Pastor Chris did a good job in addressing that and emphasizing that point this morning in his message. Christ did not die to give us a chance to be saved. And now we have to do the rest ourselves by doing some good work or to earn it. Jesus Christ did all of the work when he died on the cross for our sins. And when we place our faith in Christ alone to give us eternal life, God applies the payment that Christ paid on the cross to our, for our sins. Christ applies the payment to us, and it wipes away our sins forever. Christ died to pay all of it, and, and God applies that to us when we place our faith in Christ. Now you might be wondering, does a person need a little bit of faith to be saved? Or does a person need a lot of faith in order to, to, to be saved? I would like to answer that question with the il illustration like, like this. Uh, this is one of Linda's favorites. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I like to illustrate it like, like this. They had two brig bridges across a deep ravine that was side by side. One bridge was old. One bridge was over 150 years old. It was made of wood. Some of, some of the boards were rotten. Uh, but right next to that was a brand new bridge. It was made of concrete and steel. It was solid. And these two men walk up to, 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 to the bridge. And one of the guys said, I think I'm going to try this brand new, new, new bridge. Uh, and the other guy told him, but nobody has ever used that bridge. Nobody has ever walked on it. No truck has ever rode on it. The guy says, that's okay. I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to try this bridge. So very timidly, he, he takes a step, puts it on, on, on the bridge. Then he takes another step. Then he takes another step. Very timidly, he walks across this, this, this bridge. The other guy says, ha. Huh, this here, this bridge has been here a long time. My grandfather walked on that bridge. My daddy walked on this bridge. I walked on this bridge. I'm going to walk on, on this bridge. So with all the confidence in the world, he steps out and walks across this bridge. But the, but the, the bridge caves in and the man falls to, to his death. <coughs> the point of that illustration is this. The man who walked on, on the solid bridge had just a little bit of faith, but he had enough faith in the right object, the strong bridge. The man who walked on the weak bridge had plenty of faith, but his faith was in the wrong object. His faith was in a, a weak bridge, and he wound up falling to his death. So, so I tell you that because a person, for a person to, to, to receive eternal life, he has to make Christ the right object of his faith, even if he don't understand all of the implications of that. Even if he don't understand all the Bible says about that. If, if he understands enough 
to recognize that Christ needs to be the object of his faith. And he trusts Christ uh, for, to give him eternal life. It's all a person needs in order to get to, to heaven. But that's the first stage of our salvation. The second stage of our salvation is our present salvation. Our present salvation refers to the process of spiritual growth, that we become more Christ-like in our attitudes and thoughts and speech and priorities and anything else that pertains to our everyday life. Like the process of the spiritual growth to become like Christ is called the sanctification process. The word sanctification in scripture means to set apart. So the spiritual process of sanctification to be set apart to become more like Christ. I want you to please note that the sanctification process to become more like Christ begins at the moment a person places his faith in Christ and receives his eternal life, and it never ends until we are taken up to heaven. In other words, no Christian ever reaches full spiritual growth while he is alive on earth. Now, it is true that some Christians are more spiritually mature than other Christians, but all Christians have a ways to go to become more like Christ. The third or final stage of our salvation is our glorification stage. And this happens when a believer um, is taken to heaven. We get our new glorified bodies. We have our service for Christ tested at the judgment seat of Christ. We receive rewards for our faithful service to, to Christ. Uh, and then those rewards last for us for eternity. In other words, if you haven't seen this before, I hope this makes it a little clearer. Uh, if, if this represents a person's life, at some point in his life, he places his faith in Christ. All right? His faith in Christ. He's saved at this point. All right, so from this point on, remember that salvation is a point in time. It happens one instant when we place our faith in Christ to give us eternal life. We get our eternal life there. Then, from here, a person lives. This is the sanctification process. This is where we grow. This is where we study the Bible, learn about God, learn what God expects of us. We serve Him. We become more like Christ. This is the sanctification. And at this point, a person either dies or the rapture comes, and this is heaven bound. This is the, part, the place where we save the sanctification process. This is the place, the point that we go to, to heaven. So what is, our, what is this study that I'm going to focus on? <clears throat> our study, then carry on next week, we will focus on stage one of our salvation. We're going to focus on the first stage, right up at here. First stage. We're going to focus on when the person receives eternal life. Can he ever lose, lose that? We're not going to be talking too much about the sanctification and the heaven when we go to heaven. That's, that's a different study. But our study is if a person places his faith in Christ and he receives eternal life, can he ever lose that eternal life that God gives him the instant he places his faith in Christ? Now, we, we think that the scripture is pretty clear on that. And... Uh, that's, that's what we hope to, to show you in the weeks to, to come. Now, why is this study important? Why is this study important? It is because you can have this assurance, both from what Scripture says and also from sound theology, that you cannot lose your salvation once you have trusted Christ to take you to heaven. That, knowing that, you can
can put that issue behind you, and you can concentrate your efforts on living a godly life and growing to be like Christ. So when I ask the question, if a person was once saved, can he ever be lost? We are talking about what? A, a saved person. A person who is saved. And we are asking, can a genuine saved person lose the eternal life that God gave him when he trusted Christ for his salvation? Now, at some point in my study, down the road, I hope to cover the problem Bible verses that people try to use to say that it is possible for people who are once saved to truly lose their salvation. I hope to answer that. I hope to deal with that uh, so you, you can be aware of what any questions? Any or comments? Yes, Paul. Okay. Um, so the thing is, believing in Jesus Christ. What about people that don't think Jesus Christ was God, our Savior? Like, for example, the Jewish people. I mean. Right. They come from a long time ago, right. and it seems to me like they they missed the they missed the boat yeah. when they didn't see Jesus as the person that they've been waiting for all their life. You know? question, Paul. So what, what what about them? Right. Uh, okay. Do they have a problem? I got two. I got two. <laughs> <laughs> I think they have a problem. <laughs> I'd like to answer your question with two, two different answers. Okay. One answer is Jesus says that in, in, in the New Testament, in the Gospel, he makes the statement that no man comes up to fall to Christ but by me. That's his statement. You can, no man can come unto the Father but by me. Jesus made that statement. So nobody can be saved other than coming to Christ. You talk about the Jews. The Jews in the Old Testament, first of all, everybody who was ever saved is always saved by faith. You can't, that's God's plan to save, to save people. It's been that way since the beginning of time. It's going to always be that way. God saves people by faith in his provision for salvation. The first time this was mentioned, it was in Gen Genesis 3. After, um, after, um, Adam and Eve ate the, the forbidden fruit, and they sinned, and God made the statement there that, um, uh, that, that his son uh, was going to come, and the fact that Satan was going was to uh, bruise his heel, but he was going to crush Satan's uh, head. The people in the Old Testament looked forward in faith to God's provision for their salvation. They might not have heard of Christ, but they looked forward to the provision that God was going to give or make to take care of their sin. And as time went on, God gave people in the Old Testament, the Jews, more information, more and more information. Abraham sacrificing his son was a picture of God sacrificing his son. The Jewish priest who sacrificed the animals uh, and on the Day of, of Atonement, they, 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 they made a sacrifice for all the sins of the people. All that was a picture of what Christ was going to come. They had people saved in, in the Old Testament. They had Jewish people saved in the Old Testament. But they were looking forward to the time that Christ, that God's provision was going to come. We look back at, at the cross. They had to have faith in whatever God was going to... Uh, whatever provision he was going to supply for their, for their sin problem, we look back and we have the cross. We got a lot more information than they ever had. But people are always saved by faith in the provision that God was going to provide for, for, for their sin. And the people in the Old Testament, that, that applies to, to, to them, especially the, the Jews. Because they were God's chosen people, and God gave them the sacrificial system, and let 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 them know about uh, about in, in in a way more and more information as time went on, but they learned about God's providing for the sin. 
Nick. Yeah. Just to, to point out that Christ clearly said that because you are of the Jewish race, you you not get in on based on your race. You're right. You're you're God's chosen people, but that's not an automatic in. You're right, Tim. Thank you for pointing that out. The Jews was God's chosen people as a nation. But people were saved on an individual basis, one on one. They have their relationship with, with the, the God. And you, you, you're right. So just because a person was born a Jew uh, and, uh, of the Jewish race, that doesn't mean he was born to heaven. But as individuals, they had to, they had to put their trust in God. So what about the Jewish people today? that don't look back at the cross and Jesus. Good question. Are they, they still looking forward? Is that okay? No, or, no, no. Or they, they just miss the boat? They don't miss they the got boat them. because they have a chance to, 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 to be saved now, Paul. They have a chance to, Jesus died for them. They have God's written word. They have the New Testament, the Testament now just like we do. And there are some Jewish people who are saved. And those people are saved the same way we are. We look back at the cross, we read what the scripture says, we read what Christ says, that no man can come unto the Father but by me. And just like we have to believe that, they have to, have, have to believe it. So the Jewish people don't have an advantage, but they don't have a disadvantage. <laughs> now, now, today, because they have all the information that God wants them to have. They have Messianic Jews that do oh, they do have they do have some Jews that have trusted in Christ today. And you're right, they right, uh, Messianic Jews, that, that's what they call them because they believe in Christ as their Messiah. You're right, they do have some. Paul was a Jew. <laughs> Look at the Apostle Paul. You're right. Paul was a Jew. And the and the, the, the disciples were, were, were Jews. And all the people in the first <coughs> century church, when it first started, well, I say all, that, that, that means that, yeah. the majority of the people in the first century church, once it started in the book of Acts, they were, they were Jews. Yeah. So, you understand what I'm saying, Paul? I mean, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but, but, uh, but uh, <coughs> um, um, Well, I have a situation like my son was born and raised Catholic. Okay. He married a Jewish girl. Okay. He don't go to church. I, I, <clears throat> from what I see of, of him, he don't believe in Jesus anymore. So, you know, like he's going to his wife's Jewish belief that uh, Jesus was a prophet. Mm -hmm. Not God. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a prophet. Uh, does it sound like my son has a problem? You know what? <laughs> His problem is, is no greater than the problem of everybody else who has not yet placed their faith in Christ. They have a lot of people today who think that Mohammed or Allah or some other God other than Christ. Uh, some uh, uh, Indian God, a Hindu God, Buddha. I mean, they, they got people that are not from a Jewish background who are in the same boat that your son is. Your son is, has no more advantage or no more disadvantage than anybody else who has not placed their faith in, in, in Christ. The key is, is that he needs to get the information, the four things with the information that I shared. He needs to get the four parts of the information so that God can use that to pierce his heart, to drop the scales from his eyes so he could understand that what it's going to take for him to be saved. So he's, he's no more at a disadvantage, no more at an advantage. He's in the same boat everybody else is in okay. who has not placed it. Just because he's going to a Jewish church, that doesn't make him more than this. You know, uh, well, they don't go to the Jewish church. Okay. Just, I'm, yeah, not, just, I'm, I'm Jewish. Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> but, if he, but if he was saved when he was in the Catholic church, if he accepted Jesus, 
and he's just wandering in the wilderness right now, that he didn't lose his salvation either. He didn't lose his salvation. The key is, what was the object of his faith? Uh, but I'm saying, if he put his trust in Jesus, and now he's confused by his relationship or whatever, the fact that he's not going to church doesn't mean he's not saved, if he was once saved. Yeah, if he was once saved. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. There's a lot of people in a lot of churches who go to church, but have never placed, they never <clears throat> understood the plan of salvation, and was always working on some kind of work system to get there. That's, that's the key. Was he trusting in his, to earn it by his own effort? Or, or did, did he ever realize that, that, that his faith had to be in Christ alone to be saved? If you ask the majority of the people if they're Christian, they'll say yes. It doesn't, doesn't mean they're saved. Today, in, if you're living in America, uh, a lot of people say that, that they're Christians just because they're living here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What was the question? What did Fred say? Repeat it, Fred. Oh, there's other. I said if you ask most people today if they're Christian, they say yes. But that doesn't mean that they are saved. Tim, you had a question. I was just going to ask, um, like when I, I grew up in church, and I did all the first Sunday school, and I was in love with Jesus. But then it was like I was a baby Christian until I was 30. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like the Bible came alive and just wanted to surrender it all. You so like when it. I was younger, was that saved or not? If you played, if you were trusted in Christ, he was the object of your faith, you were saved. You were saved, but you got hung up for a period of your life up in here. You never had you never had the opportunity to study the Bible and grow and learn what the Bible says. Uh, become more like uh, like Christ. So you were saved, but you were stuck in this point without growing. If you placed your faith in Christ and he was the object of your faith, you were definitely saved. Absolutely. And there's, there's people that do that all the time. I think about the, the children that go to vacation Bible school and trust in Christ and go, and go, go home to, to a home that is not a Christian home. And the parents don't bring them back, back to church. If they placed their faith in Christ, they would they were, they were say, no, we do not need, and we're going to cover this, but I want to tell you now, we do not need evidence from our outward life to prove that, that we are saved or were saved. We, what we need to do is to look at our faith. What are you trusting in to get to heaven? What is the object of your faith? And if the object of your faith is Jesus Christ, that's all it takes. For us to have assurance that we are saved. Great question. Alright. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do what Steve did in, in, in the past. I'm gonna put my phone number and email up there. And if I can and if you still got questions, email me and I and I'll I'll I'll, 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 I'll respond to you, okay? I will put that up there right, right after this, this class. Okay? You respond in the next class. What? You gonna respond in the next class? Uh, I may or I may just give. You, I may just give give you the answer. But I may respond if they don't get up. Uh, you know, if, if if it's controllable, I'll I'll, uh, I'll do that. But I'll answer your question more than enough, either in the next class or. or uh, All right. Okay. Great. Okay. Seth, would you close? Father, we're so grateful um, for the promise of salvation that, that we've been discussing this morning. And that, uh, like Nick said, we don't need uh, evidence from our outward lives. Uh, we only need our assurance comes from your work in the cross and nothing else. And uh, we pray that um, as we face uh, attacks from the enemy um, during our daily walks, that, that we will always come back to where is our faith and that we can move on and. Uh, walk in a, in, a, in a manner that pleases you, we can become more Christ-like and not constantly be questioning uh, whether or not we are saved, but take assurance that our faith is in Christ alone and, and his, his, your grace uh, is sufficient. Uh, we thank you so much for Nick's clear presentation this morning, and uh, we look forward to the, the coming classes. We pray that you continue to be with him as he prepares, give him the time he needs and the wisdom, and uh, help us to be attentive students. We love you so much. We thank
thank you just for the opportunity to be together this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray.